In this video, we will look at the pathophysiology of malaria. We begin by recapping the life cycle of the parasite responsible for malaria. So here we have a susceptible human who possibly lives in a tropical area. The parasite responsible for malaria are the plasmodium species. The plasmodium parasites are actually carried by two, two types of creatures, one human, the other mosquitoes, Anopheles. So an adult female Anopheles mosquito carries the parasite um, and can bite this susceptible human. It bites it because the mosquito normally feeds off blood. And while feeding, it will simultaneously inject the deadly parasite into the human circulation. Let us look inside this infected mosquito to see where this actual parasite lives. So the mosquito carries the infective form of the parasite um, in the salivary glands. The infective form of the parasite in the salivary glands are known as sporozoites. During mosquito feeding, the sporozoites are also injected into circulation of the human. The sporozoites then travels to the liver, to the cells of the liver known as hepatocytes. The, sporozo the sporozoites replicate within the hepatocytes to form a schizon, which eventually ruptures, uh, releasing many merozoites. The merozoites are still the parasite, but in a different form. A particular type of plasmodium parasite called plasmodium vivax or plasmodium ovale can actually infect the hepatocyte and become a and basically become dormant, meaning that they don't replicate, they just stay in the hepatocyte for a year or two. Now this dormant form of plasmodium vivax or ovale um, are known as hypnozoites. And when the plasmodium vivax or ovale are ready or want to replicate, they, they enter the cycle. So they, you know, they replicate and they rupture the hepatocyte, releasing many merozoites. The merozoites then will enter the circulation and begin infecting red blood cells. So it actually hides within these red blood cells because red blood cells are our own cells and so the immune system cannot really attack it. But not only that, the merozoites actually feed off hemoglobin in the red blood cells. The merozoites will enter what's called the ring stage um, during replication and then become a trophozoite, which matures into schizont, and then rupture again, releasing many merozoites. It releases many merozoites into circulation, and the same cycle continues. So the, merozo the merozoites will then infect other red blood cells, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This cycle of the parasite um, is the asexual blood cycle, and is responsible for the clinical manifestations of the disease, which is fever, chills, sweating. Anyways, from the ring stage, some parasites uh, will differentiate into sexual stages. So some of these parasites will become gametocytes, either male gametocytes or female gametocytes. Then, when another Anopheles mosquito comes along, uh, this, this other Anopheles mosquito is not infected, um, by the way, and when this un un uninfected Anopheles mosquito bites the human for feeding, it will suck up at the same time the gametocytes, the male and female parasitic gametocytes. The gametocytes will enter the mosquito's stomach and will enter what's called the sporogonic, spor sporogonic state cycle. I think I pronounced that right. And this is where essentially the male gametocyte and female gametocyte will form a zygote. The zygote in turn becomes a motile and elongated euconate. Euconite, Euconite, <laughs> which develops into an oocyte. The oocyte grows and then it will rupture, releasing sporozoites, where, which will make their way to the mosquito's salivary glands. Inoculation of the sporozoite into a new human host perpetuates the malaria life cycle. So you can see how this cycle can become very vicious, repetitive, and easily and can easily spread. 
Now that we know a little about the life cycle, let us concentrate on the pathogenesis, so what we see in the human um, in terms of clinical signs. So the spleen of the human is responsible for killing damaged red blood cells, amongst many other things. So we can have normal red blood cells, and we can also have the infected red blood cells, infected by the merozoites in the asexual cycle, remember. The splenic macrophages have a central role in sensing and phagocytizing these infected red blood cells, and they are exposed to high numbers of parasites in the process. As a consequence, these cells these macrophages kill many red blood cells, which can eventually lead to anemia, but also it will lead to uh, the production of large amounts of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha and interleukin-B. So there are two ways that the pro-inflammatory cytokines are released. One, when these macrophages are exposed to the actual parasites in circulation, or two, when the macrophage in the spleen just engulfs it, engulfs the, the damaged red blood cells, which then will consequently result in the production and release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. These pro-inflammatory cytokines are released in a cyclic manner. These cytokines cause the fever. They are pyrexic, which is associated with signs of malarial illness, such as chills, rigor, low blood pressure, headache, excessive perspiration, sweating basically, and hyperprexia. These pyrexic cytokines also causes impaired erythropoiesis, which contribute to the anemia we see in malaria. Okay, so that was one event that occurs uh, in the pathophysiology of malaria, which was the release of cytokines. So the macrophages and monocytes uh, release TNF-alpha and interleukin-1b, but also they release interferon gamma, which takes us to the next uh, pathological event that occurs in, the, in a malarial infection. Um, this next event, this next pathological event, actually affects the, the, the blood vessels, small capillaries, um, within organs such as the brains, lungs, placenta, and the kidneys. So it's important to know that the parasite, when it infects red, red blood cells, it actually causes the red blood cells to express a surface protein. The TNF-alpha and interferon gamma, released by monocytes or macrophages, actually increases the expression of adhesion molecules um, by endothelial cells for these surface proteins. So these adhesion molecules on endothelial cells include CD36 and ICAM1, amongst many others. The cytokines released by monocytes and macrophages also increase vascular permeability in organs. Depending on the location of the organ, the adhesion molecules expressed by the endothelial cells are different. So for example, in the brain, it is CD36 and ICAM1 that are expressed on endothelial cells. So what happens is that if an infected red blood cell does not bind to an, to an adhesion molecule on, um, on an endothelial cell, it will be cleared up by the splenic macrophages. However, if an infected red blood cell can adhere to an, to an adhesion molecule on an endothelial cell, it will trigger coagulation by acting activating thrombin. So essentially it will create a clot. It will form what's known as a rosetti, which are essentially red blood cells coagulating with one another, like forming a clot. And this can lead to inflammation. So we can get tissue inflammation. The, in tissue inflammation, we get disruption of endothelial barrier integrity and a favor of local uh, tissue inflammation we can get leukocyte infiltration into the tissue. So to summarize, in the brain, if we have obstruction of the vessels and local inflammation here, this can lead to what's called cerebral malaria, which is fatal. In the lungs, 
the obstruction of vessels and local inflammation contribute to acute respiratory distress. In the placenta, if it is a pregnant lady, the obstruction of vessel and local inflammation can contribute to placental ma malaria, which is fatal as well. Finally, the kidneys. Kidney problems can be caused by anemia and the tissue inflammation and coagulation process. And this will lead to renal impairment and me metabolic acidosis. And this can all uh, cause hypoxia and hyperventilation due to the increase in acidity. Okay, so that was somewhat a detailed overview of what occurs in malaria. We had a release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, we had adherence of plasmodium-infected red blood cells. As well as we had the rupture and removal of parasites and altered red blood cells by splenic macrophages. Let us now look into more detail how the pro-inflammatory cytokines actually get triggered, get released. Remember, the pro-inflammatory cytokines are thought to be responsible for the signs and symptoms of malaria, which is the chills, the fever, and the rigor. Let us just say here is the outer membrane of a macrophage, and here is the nucleus of the macrophage where we can find the DNA. Okay, now let me introduce things called PAMPs, which are pathogen-associated molecular patterns. And these are just structures that can be detected by immune cells. The red blood cell can be ingested by the macrophage in the spleen, right? And as a consequence the, of phagocytosis, the genetic material of the parasite is released. The genetic material is a, is a, a pathogen associated molecular pattern and can be detected by toll like receptors, which are receptors, uh, important receptors in, in the innate immune system. GPI, which is another structure found in plasmodium parasites, uh, can be released when the parasite infects red, red blood cells. GPI is properly called uh, glycosyl phosphatidyl inositol and are recognized also by toll-like receptors on the plasma membranes of immune cells. Um, when the toll-like receptor recognizes GPI, um, it triggers an intracellular cascade leading to the activation of transcription factor, nuclear factor kappa B, um, NFKB. NFKB moves to the nucleus where it activates the transcription of pro-inflammatory cytokines that are the, the pro-TNF-alpha and pro-interleukin-1b. Pro-inflammatory cytokines means that they are not active essentially, so they need to be activated and we will actually see how, how this happens. Another pathogen associated molecular pattern is um, hemozoine, which is a product of parasite metabolism of heme within red blood cells. Hemozoine are released, which can be taken up by macrophages. Hemozoine, through several processes, can lead to the activation of cas caspase 1. Caspase 1 is a molecule complex responsible for activating the pro inflammatory cytokines. So it will convert the pro-inflammatory cytokines to cytokines. I hope that makes sense. So it converts the pro-interleukin-1b to the active interleukin-1b. So that was talking about PAMPs. There's also another thing called DAMPs, which are damage-associated molecular patterns. DAMPs are endogenous components released from stressed, damaged, or dying cells that can activate toll-like receptors on immune cells. We have three main DAMPs. These are uh, associated with uh, malaria. These are urate, heme, and microvessels. Urate can be endostized, causing activation of caspase 1. And we know what caspase 1 does. Heme can be recognized by plasma membrane toll-like receptors. The microvessels uh, and toll-like receptor can lead to the activation of the nuclear factor kappa B, which as we know is a transcription factor 
activating the transcription of pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha and interleukin-1b, which subsequently gets activated through ca by caspase-1. So that was a really brief overview of the different PAMPs and DAMPs that activate or trigger the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, cytokines um, which will result in the clinical manifestations of malaria, which is the fever, rigor. Um. To make things a bit more confusing, the macrophage is also an antigen-presenting cell and thus can activate T cells through MHC1 or MHC2, um, depending on what T cell it is. And this can amplify or enhance uh, the release of interferon gamma, um, which, as we know, uh, sort of it stimulates the expression of adhesion molecules on endothelial cells and thus the for formation of rosette, the clot, the coagulation, and thus um, trigger inflammation as well. So I hope you enjoyed this video on the pathophysiology of malaria. Thank you for watching.